Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this very Chicago weather. I really appreciate you all coming out. I'm Kate sears Batowski, Director of Programming for Expo Chicago, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary edition this upcoming April 13 to 16. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here for this conversation with our 2023 guest curators, Claudia Segura, Curator of Exhibitions and Collection at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona, and Aimee Iglesias Lucan, Director and Chief Curator of the America Society in New York. Claudia will curate this year's in situ program, which showcases large-scale sculpture, video, film, and site-specific works throughout Festival Hall, while our 2023 exposure section, which highlights solo and two artist presentations from galleries 10 years and younger, will be curated by Aime. Claudia and Aime will be joined in conversation regarding overlapping themes of identity and place and their curatorial practices by Carla Acevedo Yates, Marilyn and Larry Fields curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, whose recently opened exhibition forecast form, Art in the Caribbean Diaspora, 1990s to Today, envisions a new approach to contemporary art in the Caribbean diaspora. We visited shortly before we came here, and I can say that is a knockout presentation. I went for the opening, didn't get a chance to see a lot of work, so it was a great revisit. I strongly encourage you all to make a trip. The conversation is presented as a part of Expo Chicago's Regional Dialogue Series, which offers panel discussions, conversations, and provocative artistic discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on the current issues that engage them. This conversation will be available after this panel to watch digitally on our website, and I strongly encourage you to watch there as well. I would like to thank the Chicago Athletic Association and Jill Perez for partnering on this program, in addition to the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago for their partnership and video production team. Our collaborator, Kathy, will be live captioning the program. If you need so, please find a QR code at the back on one of our high boys, which will gain you access to the live transcript. After the conversation, there'll be a short time for questions. And please stick around for a bit afterwards for a bar at the back and a little bit of a meet and greet. Thank you all for coming, and please join me in welcoming Carla, Aime, and Claudia to the stage. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us on this chilly Saturday afternoon. My name is Carla Acevedo Yates, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by my esteemed colleagues, Claudia and Aime. Um, welcome to Chicago. To get started, I thought that I would offer some thoughts that I wrote about the themes of the panel, identity and place, um, in relation to my own curatorial practice. For me personally, these have been two important subjects that I have been wrestling with in my work for over 10 years. In particular, because there's always seems to be an expectation placed on Latinx and Latin American artists and curators on the subject of representation, meaning the relationship between object and maker, or the biographical and contextual as expressed in the artwork. An expectation that perhaps is not placed upon others whose work doesn't carry the burden of legibility along the lines of identity and place. The questions or expectations that arise are, what kind of art we should be making or are expected to make? What kind of subject matter we should be approaching? And perhaps most importantly, that somehow the work that we do necessarily reflects our identity as othered, that is, who we are, where we come from, or where we are in relation to the dominant culture. That means that oftentimes the biography of the maker, artist, or curator is tied inextricably to the work of art. And to that I always say, not necessarily so. And I think the not necessarily so is important because the work that I am drawn to approaches ideas around identity and place, but perhaps not in the ways that satisfy those expectations I spoke about earlier. These expectations might appear in a work as narrative, illustrative, and didactic. And oftentimes, these elements might override formal readings and take precedent at the expense of the process, techniques, and materials of a work of art, 
which is one of the main arguments of the exhibition I organized at the MCA, which is up right now, Forecast Form, Art in the Caribbean Diaspora, 1990s Today. At the end, it seems, there's always questions around representation that offer even more questions to be posed, challenged, and perhaps better left unanswered. Some of the questions raised in Forecast Form are, what is and where is the Caribbean? Who makes art in the Caribbean? And what does art in the Caribbean look like? But it is also trying to further a way of looking at and analyzing works formally through what I call the, the mechanics of diaspora. That is, looking at transfer, dispersal, and displacement as formal techniques and aesthetic strategies that make us rethink ideas around identity and place. So this isn't about rejecting these ideas around identity and place, but rather about looking at the artwork itself and its making to guide us through those questions instead of looking outside of it and then expect the artwork to perform or illustrate a set of ideas outside of itself. In my practice, I'm also looking at an exhibition as an object and curatorial practice as a spatial practice. I'm thinking about the exhibition and ex ex an experience to be felt with all of our senses and making very particular choices around lighting, spacing, and cadence. And I could talk so much more about this show, but I really want to pivot to my colleagues whose work we will soon be able to experience at Expo Chicago. So I thought that maybe we could start with you, Aime. Uh, maybe you can introduce your curatorial practice and talk about a recent project that has been important for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla, and congratulations on your spectacular show. I imagine everybody here probably saw it already, and if not, you must. It's really a fantastic exhibition, not only in the thesis that it proposes, but uh, the artworks are really stunning, and the installation of the show is impeccable, which is a detail that we know is super important. People might not notice, but a good install really makes a difference in the way that you can read the artworks. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you. I think it's super uh, provocative and interesting what you said, and it's something that affects all of us in the practice. I mean, it affects me personally, also as a migrant uh, professional in the arts in the United States. I'm originally from Argentina, and I moved here in 2011 to study my master's uh, at, um, in NYU. Uh, and I were you in, in New York, and then I stayed to my PhD, and I worked in different capacities in different institutions and foundations, um, but I've been at the America Society since 2019, and the project that you can see in the images and the one that I chose to present had a lot to do with what Carla just mentioned, and it's called This Must Be the Place. Um, that is an exhibition that we did in two parts in, at the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, uh, and it's an exhibition uh, that reunited, that, that discussed the work of Latin American artists that had migrated to New York during the 1960s and the 1970s, and with a special emphasis on those that had worked with new media and the new styles of minimalism, conceptualism, or, you know, uh, those categories I feel are insufficient to describe their practice or anybody's practice, but that was part of the argument we're trying to do, expand this idea of what conceptual art was beyond what the textbooks have traditionally taught us. And also a special emphasis in trying to see how their work discuss ideas of identity, ideas of, uh, you know, uh, of, of place, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to sound repetitive with the subject of the conversation, but it really was the case that many of these very conceptual or very experimental artworks were one way or another talking about the experience of being a migrant and the experience of being in between places, in between cultures, in between languages, and sometimes they were discussing the way that they found American culture to be you know, how they saw American culture in ways that maybe Americans cannot, you know, uh, see because precisely they're too immersed in their own culture to realize. And they were also talking about issues of the realities of their countries uh, back in the south, somewhere in the continent. And, um, and, and a special emphasis also in trying to show the connections among those artists 
to demonstrate that they were very connected with the American uh, neo vanguard scenes, that they were uh, doing shows and practicing and doing activities with a lot of the famous names that we know, but also showing the connections that they did with each other and the, the, the communities that they created for themselves to be able to discuss things that maybe they couldn't discuss with other counterparts. Mm. At the end, I mean, a hypothesis that ran through the show and that I believe that the show demonstrated or I, that I believe that this artist practice demonstrates is that New York as an international art center, the way that we know it now, is being born in the late 1960s. And the thesis, the idea that nobody wants to think but I think we need to enforce is that that was only possible because of the amount of migrant artists that came to the city and how New York became a cosmopolitan center. And I'm not just talking about Latin American artists here, I'm also talking about names like Shashoi Kusama, Yoko Ono, and so many other, you know, uh, European, Asian, and, you know, uh, uh, South American artists that came to the city. Um, and I think, you know, that, that in that, um, in that, you know, in, in, in that difference, in that variety, in that cosmopolitanism, is that we find the richness of the city and the, the New York that we know today. So yes, um, the exhibition also um, was part, you know, initially of my doctoral dissertation. I had been researching this topic for uh, over 10 years by the time that we did the show. And um, we also did a series of uh, symposiums and like interviews with artists, but also a book that is this one, um, that is called This Must Be The Place. The title of the show uh, is, you know, is inspired by the Talking Heads song. Um, and the reason why we wanted to call it, uh, what I, I mean, this was in my dissertation, why I call my dissertation and the book and the project, this must be the place, is because I felt that the word must was capital in this idea of instability of categories that Carla was describing. What happens with these artists, and I think what ultimately happens with all of us, is that you never know if New York or Chicago or whatever you are is the place. It must be the place, but we are never sure. And it, it is in the making of, a, of your own space, in the making of these communities, in the making of these networks, that you find a sense of identity and a sense of home beyond home. So um, it was a beautiful project, and it's something that also, I think, speaks to a lot of us that are living in different cities than the ones where we grow up. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, an experience of international migration like mine, but in a way I feel that, that the experience of somebody that maybe was born in, I don't know, a small town in Arkansas and then moves to a big city like Chicago is equally uh, displacing <laughs> as the experience that I have, even though that person might have better English than I do or might have a passport, which is something that I had to wait a long time to get. I, I think that we have to rethink uh, ideas of belonging to, to realize that this is an experience that a lot of us go through. And I feel that the work of these artists is a beautiful way to make us think about all these issues. Yeah, and I got to see the first part of the show because I believe there were two parts, right? And I was really impressed with how many artists that I was, I was unaware that spent some time in New York that are really well known internationally in Latin America. So that was really great. And the book is amazing, so congratulations. Um, so now I want to turn it to you, Claudia, before we get into the expo themes. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about your work and a recent project that you've worked on? Great, thank you so much. Well, I totally agree with what Amy said about the show of Carla. It's amazing, it's beautiful, um, and uh, very inspiring as well. Uh, well, I work as curator of, of exhibitions and collections at MAGBA, Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona. But it's very, I'm very happy that actually this talk is about place because my trajectory uh, moved around places. So I started in London, then I moved back to Barcelona, then I went to Turkey, then I lived in Bogota for four years. And that was, had a big impact in my personal development as well as professional career. And I would like to focus on one exhibition that actually has this connection with Colombia and um, me being there. 
Um, as a curatorial practice, I'm very much interested in the potential of affect, how affects actually relate to my practice, and how these affects are related to this exhibition specifically. You will see some images going around. Um, this exhibition is now happening actually in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona. And when I started to do the research three years ago of this figure, Maria Teresa Incapié, I didn't want to have the first exhibition of hers in Spain. So I asked Emiliano Valdez, who is the chief curator of the Museum of Modern Art in Medellin, to do the research with me. Um, also a sort of a decolonial perspective as well and understanding um, where I was coming from, what was the Museum of Contemporary Art in Spain, and what Maria Teresa Incapié was also um, interested in her political side. So um, the, the show is entitled If This Were a Beginning of Infinity. And Maria Teresa Incapié uh, was a figure, a Colombian artist, uh, that was interested in long durational performance. But actually, she was trained in theater. She belonged to Acto Latino, which is a theater group that was mostly uh, interested in the poor theater. So they were following theories by Jerzy Grotowski, Eugenio Barba. And Maria Teresa Incapié, when she decided to leave the theater, she started her solo career, let's say. But she never, at the beginning, she didn't use the word performance, but she used the word training. So she was very much interested in a sort of elasticity of the performative field. She was someone pioneer in Colombia and an artist of artists. Although she died very young, 54 years, from a terrible cancer. So um, it's, it was fascinating for us to suddenly encounter all these archival material archival material that was made with documentation, videos, uh, photography, but it was a limited archival material as well. So we were, when we started the research with Emiliano, we, we needed to talk with people, to interview people, because in the end, Maria Teresa Incapié, what she was doing was actions that were very intangible. There were not really objects on them. Um, an action would be walking for many hours, even days, doing a pilgrimage. So therefore, there was this uh, necessity of um, bringing the intangible in the research itself. Therefore, we did a lot of interviews, uh, curators, friends, um, artists. Maria Teresa lived in a house in the 90s in Bogota with Doris Salcedo, Maria Fernanda Cardoso, uh, Carolina Poncelon, so people that are very important that shaped somehow the history of Colombian art. And um, that was very important, but also it was very important to talk to friends of her, friends that would uh, go out to walk their dogs with her. Um, and because she was doing durational performance, we could find a lot of doc documentation that was not coming from the official archive. So therefore, that was very important for the, for the exhibition. And we found ourselves somehow doing this, ar this archaeological research that was filled with intangible, um, affective uh, notions. And this is very important um, as a curatorial practice. Moreover, um, there was a very fundamental element for the research of the exhibition, which was to go to visit Maria Teresa's son. Maria Teresa, in 1996, bought a land in the vicinity of uh, Santa Marta, in Quebrada Valencia. It's very close to a um, holy land of the uh, indigenous group Kogis. And she bought there a land where she wanted to do what she called a school village, so a place for residencies, for artists to come and somehow uh, interact with her. So she believed that living in collectivity would bring knowledge that would be transformative. Maria Teresa's son lives there still now. So we decided with Emiliano to do this pilgrimage. You need to go to this place, and the only way you can do it is by walking two hours in the jungle. So we did that. And doing that as, a, as engaging the body, it, what, for me, this is also part of the research of the curatorial uh, work that we were engaging ourselves, not only in the conversations with people, but also our bodies being there, living what she lived, seeing what she saw. Um, you will see in the images that thanks to this conversation and this leaving for three days with Santiago, we could actually do an set up in the exhibition some sort of uh, mise-en-scene, some sort of resignifications of some installations that she did with him. So therefore, in the exhibition, we wanted to have this, 
we wanted to bring to the audience this sense that you were actually entering in a space where she was there, even if her body was not there. But we were also missing the body, and we were doing an exhibition that wanted to talk about the performative side and, and the elasticity of it. So therefore, we invited three artists um, that were close to Maria Teresa, very close to her in her personal life, but also professional life. So therefore, again, the affect was, was essential for the selection, who are somehow um, doing a dialogue with the posthum artists, and also something very important for the curatorial practice as well, understanding the archive, not as something that is fossilized, not as something that is in a vitrine, but something that mutates, a sort of a flesh that can be somehow um, sent to the future through the voices of others. So we invited Coco Fusco. She did a beautiful video that maybe some of you saw in the Whitney Biennial called uh, Your Eyes Will Be an Empty Word that she produced. She was commissioned by us for the exhibition. Then we also invited Mapa Teatro, who's a collective of performing arts, who did a beautiful um, sound sculpture to be activated by the audience. So the audience was kind of um, feeling founding themselves as performers somehow. And also we, um, we invited Maria Jose Arjona. Maria Jose Arjona is a Colombian artist and she works on directional performance and she was a student of Maria Teresa Incapié. And I really wanna focus on this specific commission. You will see some images. You see the boxes in the window of Magba and you will see here the performers. So Maria, Maria Jose, what she did was to work with seven performers, local performers, and uh, with them work on texts, on uh, different texts that Maria Teresa wrote, but also installations, uh, interviews, different things that they found on the archive that we uh, kind of put together. And they work together and they do this performance during the six months of the exhibition, every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, during the hours of opening of the museum. So it's a durational performance that mutates every day, that changes every day, and that is not only on the floor of the exhibition, but takes over all the museum, museum even the outside. So this is interesting thinking about identity, plays, the idea of transcultural identity, the idea of plays as something that is very also porous, that is not something static, but very, that mutates. Um, and it's also an interesting um, piece because it also does something that is important for my curatorial practice, which is create community. The exhibition itself created a community, it's a polyphony, of researchers, it's a polyphony of artists, but most of it, this um, choreography, this piece called In Silence But Together, creates this community of performers, performers with the audience, performers that are also hired by the institution in terms of a micropolitic institution. If we think about an institution also, it's important that this show has a reaction on the micropolitics of it. So therefore hiring performers for six months that become staff of the museum. So all these issues were important in, in, in the curating. I also understand the curatorial practice as something that um, allows us to think about the institution because working in an institution. Um, and there's, there's something that the director of MAGBA, Elvira de Anganeose, repeats quite a lot, which is that an exhibition not only happens in a museum, but it happens to a museum. So therefore, it impacts on the museum. It really changes the daily life of the museum and the institution. And, um, and I believe this um, performance does, and well, this is the, the intention. Thank you so much, Claudia. It's such an important project, and I believe it's still up now. Yeah. So if you're ever in Barcelona soon, it's up until April... 20. April 20. So you're all very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now pivoting to Expo Chicago and um, your sections, I was wondering, I may if you could talk a little bit about exposure and how this must be the place as a research project has shaped and impacted your process. Thank you. Thank you. So as... Some of you might know Exposure is a section of the gallery that presents uh, so-called young galleries in the sense of galleries that had been for less than 10 years with solo or uh, true artist uh, presentations. 
Um, I was thrilled when I was invited because it was a way to, in a way, uh, going back to what you said, expand uh, this idea that I was trying to see in this must be the place of creating community in this, uh, at least, you know, in this fantasy that we can see of seeing all these artists from all over the world uh, presenting in Expo Chicago these um, mostly young artists, but there's a lot of also very important historical uh, recuperation projects that are being presented in Exposure next year. We received a fantastic rooster of applications. Um, it was hard to choose. We had to leave out like amazing presentations, amazing artists, amazing galleries. But uh, I'm very happy that we were able to, we're going to be able to present um, a lot of galleries from all over the world, and especially from the global south. We have galleries from Romania, galleries from Greece, galleries from Uganda, um, Brazil, um, Buenos Aires. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really international. It's really uh, international and not just meaning uh, Paris, New York, Japan, you know, but like truly, you know, including countries that typically you don't see in our first. Um, and, you know, the artists come from all over. A lot of these projects, for example, this, this is just to give you an example, the gallery from Athens is bringing an artist from Chile, and I love that crossover, you know, that through circumstances they ended up working with an artist from the other end of the world, and they're going to bring them to Chicago. Um, so, yes, that was very important in terms of the selecting process to create the dialogue and also to have intergenerational experiences, to have uh, these very young artists uh, along with uh, artists that are in their 70s and 80s, and to show you know, some continuities and dialogues among those works. Are there any particular artists that you're excited to see um, in the section? Yes, there's, there's a lot of artists that I've discovered for, for, you know, for, for the fair, and that I'm really excited to see. There's... Um, uh, I'm going to highlight, I mean, it's, it might be like my, my soft spot, you know, uh, and the recognize um, uh, older artists. I, I know that might not be the best way to refer to them, but I, I really, you know, value the experience of uh, elders. You know, I believe they have a lot to tell us. There's a lot of stories that we have missed. Um, there's like three artists in particular, um, Susanna Wall, who is an artist I did not knew about, and she's from Chile, lived in Canada, and is now living in Mexico in Oaxaca. Uh, she has this amazing practice that I had no idea about, even though I'm supposed to be a specialist in Latin American art. I'm thrilled to have this, you know, like learn about her. I don't want to say discover, because we shouldn't say discover. These artists have been always there. It was our fault not to know about them, you know. Um, but, you know, there's also like a Milano Gallery M77 that is bringing Gracia Vanisco and Maria Lai, two amazing artists from the 1960s, doing op art or, you know, uh, and I have no idea about them either, and the pieces are spectacular. So, yeah, that's what I like to highlight. Sounds amazing. Um, so, Claudia, maybe you can talk a little bit about in situ and some of the themes that you're thinking for this section. In particular, I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about how ideas around community and performance are shaping your selection. I see that's really important in your curatorial work. Yeah, thank you. Well, I was so excited to actually be invited to in situ because um, the relationship that I had with Chicago was, uh, four years ago I started a research on Sunra. So therefore Sunra, as you know, um, developed uh, his career here. So um, I, I knew about some galleries and I had all these ideas about Chicago. So being here, it's an amazing opportunity. So um, I'm very glad for it. And for in situ, obviously the idea of Sunra had to be somewhere there, but I was very interested in developing um, a project that it's called And the Sea Spoke, which is Y el Mar Tomó la Palabra. It's not exactly the same translation in Spanish but it, to English, but well. Um, and I was very much interested in, in the poetic, kind of using the poetic potential of fabulation to somehow speculate about future, past, and present. And in that sense, how nature became a crucial component in this storytelling, somehow trying to 
um, underline those stories that are underneath the dominant idea of history and how landscape was shaping them, how landscape also was related to myth, made magic, fantasy, not only as a tangible territory, but as a mindset, how also that was a political potential and political tool to talk about resistance, to talk about um, different elements that are related with social and cultural. Somehow, landscape understood, or the idea was to embrace these this kind of um, different cultural symbolisms that are under an idea of landscape. So, um, um, yeah, the idea of the tales is very interesting, is very important in, in, in this kind of um, curatorial proposal. And so we will see a large um, sculptures, large installations. Here is the performative side of it. So you will have to walk around. There's a kind of a bodily experience with these installations, even sound of artists that actually deal with these issues, such as Julien Creuset, which, who's represented by Document Gallery, who's based here in Chicago. Obviously, there, were, there will be kind of an homage to Sandra, even a quote of his poetry in the curatorial text and a work by him. We will also have Rosario Zorraquín from um, Isla Flotante, Buenos Aires. We will also have Carlos Alfonso, who's a young artist from Colombia, represented by Casa Rigner, who's dealing with this idea of landscape as something that is more um, kind of in a can cannibalistic way, but also myth, so spirituality is an element that will be very present in these large installations, sort of opening up portals somehow, so understanding not only the landscape as something that you see, but something that has much more understandings. Um, who else do we have, are we gonna have? Paul Mignard, also from Terompochi, with a big painting. Well, and many others that you will discover in, in April. Um, and as, as the idea of collectivity, which is also important to shape, as you were saying, Carla, the, the curatorial proposal, I really believe it as a, um, as something that is built on the poetic dialogues between objects, species, and natures, calling somehow for a diversity of narrators that can be uh, connected with this intangible um, knowledge that is in all of these practices. It's so interesting for me to hear so many overlapping interests between yeah. both of you <laughs> and myself, so it's been really fruitful and really generative and I'm really happy that Forecast Forum is going to be up for Expo Chicago because yeah, there's some fantastic. overlapping artists as well. Um, and I have one final question before we turn it over to the audience um, for some questions. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how your selection process or some of the artists or the ideas that you're working with resonate within the context of Chicago. You start? We have some galleries from Chicago who are very happy also, you know, to, to have that dialogue, but also uh, I, Chicago is a cosmopolitan center also, a big one, and I believe that a lot of the artists, I mean, I meant it when I said that in a way the fantasy trying to select these artists was to create like a new temporary diaspora for Chicago, right, where artists in Chicago could dialogue with artists from all over the world, from places that typically they don't interact with. I forgot to mention, for example, we also have a gallery from Tehran, from Iran, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't know, and with issues, political issues, cultural issues, and experiences that, uh, that, that that might not, you know, be in discussion here, even though, you know, again, Chicago is a super uh, international city. Chicago is a super politicized city. The political history of Chicago is fundamental for New York and so many other cities. Uh, it's been so influential historically. Uh, and, and I know that some of these artists are very uh, interested in that. Um, and, and I hope that it's going to create a lot of echoes and a lot of, uh, hopefully, a lot of like experiences beyond the fair, where some of the artists that might come for the fair or the galleries that might bring these artists to the fair might continue this dialogue with the local artists that, you know, that, and by local I don't mean people born and raised in Chicago, I mean local cosmopolitan Chicago people. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree with what you say. And for in situ, as I mentioned, there are some galleries that are presenting their, their artists, but also even there are artists that are presented in, in exhibitions like yours, for example. And some of them, for example, that 
have been to Chicago because of personal reasons, they have friends, artists, so they resonate also with the scene. And as you were saying, this idea of global somehow being created, this community created around the fair, this idea that these artists are gonna be connected, they are already, but they are gonna be even more connected with the scene here. And, um, and as I mentioned, Sanra as being someone that was here, obviously, and that connected with another word, which is the music word that it has a lot to do with the scene of Chicago and is also related with Julien Creuset, who has a completely kind of own um, research coming from Martinique, but he uses a lot the language, he uses a lot the music, he's fascinated by Sanra, by Afrofuturism. So there's so many connections that you can start establishing no, and I really hope that in C2 Exposure, Expo Chicago will actually even bring more than the ones that we're thinking. Thank you so much. I, for one, am very excited to see your projects um, come to life um, next April. So thank you so much for sharing our, your ideas with all of us. And now um, we're ready to take some questions from the audience, if there are any takers. If not right away, I have a question that I can <laughs> start us off on. Um, I may love hearing you talk about this must be the place and what that means for an artist, a curator, anyone moving into a city that just picking the city and making the most out of it, building a community no matter where they are, what took them there, what circumstances brought them to a certain location in this world. and. I know that each of you are living in a much different place than you grew up, well, except Claudia, who's back in Barcelona after growing up there, but spent time in Colombia. And so I'm curious for each of you, kind of maybe uh, an example from your life about really leaning into whatever city you kind of landed in, no matter whether you had the, the choice or the, the foresight or not of going to that location. <laughs> Well, something that came up uh, in response to your question, that came up uh, in the research, but that is also very much a personal experience of mine, but that a lot of artists said, uh, you know, is that migrating is really hard. <laughs> and maybe a lot of you here know about it. Uh, even when, you know, you do it under, you know, the most privileged circumstances, you know, or somehow privileged circumstances, you know, uh, I would consider myself very lucky in the way that I migrated. I migrated with a partner that was American, so my visa situation got solved very easily. Um, I migrated as a middle class person with uh, a strong educational background that, you know, but I also, you know, had to wait, uh, you know, years to be able to study here because I couldn't gather the money, you know. I mean, it's a little bit complicated for uh, all of us, but. Certainly, I, I consider myself privileged, and there are so many other experiences of migrants there that have terrible circumstances. Um, but migrating, I think, is hard for anybody. I don't know. I think that um, that um, that you see that in, in the artists, and, and and I think that that we have to let it be complicated and not make these cities, especially New York, you know, which is, there is such a myth about New York being the place where you can make it there, you can make it everywhere, you know, like Sinatra said, um, and try to de-romanticize the migrating experience and de-romanticize the idea of making it in the city. There's a lot of reasons why I still live in New York. There's a lot of reasons why I would leave New York in a split second if I got another job, right? So I think it's complicated, like everything. You know, choices in life are complicated, and, um, and I don't know, I think you see that in the practice of a lot of the artists in the show that I did. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that responds. Maybe not so positive, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know, my, my own experience being in Colombia um, was um, very, very good and I'm very privileged for that actually, as you were saying. So I didn't arrive in Colombia. It was a decision that we made with my partner as well, <laughs> partners around. And, um, but but I, I'm, I really wanted to um, be away from this idea of parachuting curator that gets in a place and then 
repeats what she or he has done previously and not gets into the context and understand the context. So I really didn't want to do that. I'm not interested. So um, the first year was fantastic to meet all these artists that I already was interested in and how also I was very lucky. The art scene in Colombia got me amazingly well. Um, I had the chance to work in an amazing space that actually dealt with the idea of site-specific productions. So therefore, the idea of place was all the time thought in the productions that we were doing, inviting the artist. And um, it was interesting because the, fir the first exhibition that I did in NC Arte, which is the place where I started to work when I got to Bogota, was a performance by Xavier Leroy that he does with people from the, the city where he does this performance. And we worked with performers from the university, the national university. And all of them had different backgrounds. They, were, they had different um, story situations. So that was very interesting for me to understand also the notion of um, this porous place that I had in my head that actually was completely different and really being humble to understand and to learn and learn and learn and learn. So, um, and it has actually had an important impact in my curatorial practice. Now that I'm back to Barcelona, the place where I'm from, but I'm not sure, of course I consider it my home, but I consider my home Bogota, I consider my home London. So, you know, um, and in the end also the relationship that you establish with different people, different backgrounds. So um, I don't know if I actually answered to your question, but just a commentary. <laughs> yes, one question here. Um, I'm curious to know, since we're talking about your curatorial practice and how you view curating, and I think one of the things about Expo that's so remarkable is its focus on curatorial practice, the Curators Forum and bringing in curators. How has um, presenting or being given this opportunity to, to curate in the context of a fair mm -hmm. um, shaped or had you, I mean, what are the opportunities that you see in it that maybe have made you think differently or um, opened up new ways of looking at your curatorial practice? Yeah. Well, I mean, to start what you already said, you know, the possibility of not be curating in any fair, but a fair that has a strong, if you like, curatorial and academic component, right? Uh, it's a very special fair in that regard. It's a very unique fair, and that is, you know, gives, I mean, it gives you, you know, like, it gives you a sense of uh, security, right? That you know that you're working with people that understand curatorial practice. Uh, my experience is that I got a lot of freedom, a lot of resources to, to select. Um, you know, I'm also lucky that I'm working on the shoulder of a very large structure with a lot of years and that a lot of uh, very esteemed colleagues did this before me and did it very well. So it's about continuing, you know, making sure that you are at the level of like the people that did it before you. But I mean, the team is really great. I mean, at the end, you know, a fair like a museum, like, or like any museum or you know, any curatorial endeavor is at the end a curatorial, a, a group project. It's a collective project. You never work on your own. My ideas are irrelevant in comparison to the importance of getting a good art installer. And I don't mean this in Expo Chicago, in any show that I do, you know, like having a good team, a good press person, a good designer, and a good art installer is way more important than any brilliant idea I might have. Uh, it's like a film production, you know, it's not like being a novelist that you should type in your ideas in a paper, uh, being a curator. So, yeah, and there's a fantastic team, so that makes it much easier. Yeah, definitely. Totally agree. The team is amazing, all the resources. For me, it was really like an opportunity. I, I, I had a lot of fun doing, uh, thinking about the curatorial project and also the fact that in situ um, you select artists from the list of galleries that have accepted um, and are in the fair. It was like a dream. You could select all the artists that you wanted, the artists that you want to work with, and also showing large scale 
installations that sometimes when you're doing an exhibition, you, well, you have problems of budget or you have to. So this had a lot of freedom and also the idea that those works are gonna be in between the booths is also a different navigation. You have to establish different relationship with them. And um, I really felt with, that I had a lot of freedom to present whatever I wanted. I had this idea. Uh, the team was very supportive, obviously, with all the resources. They were amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to actually also put together artists that maybe in a show in a museum I wouldn't put together. And then suddenly here they really worked uh, because they are going to be separated by different halls. Well, I don't know. It's, it's a different idea of understanding the space as well. It's really an opportunity for me. I think it has, um, yeah. And if I may add something to what you just said, I mean, I think it is precisely because it is an art fair that we get a freedom that we wouldn't get in a museum. Mm -hmm. Because in a museum, you're supposed to prove that the artist that you're showing has already certain fame or certain knowledge by the press. You have a board pressing you to show something that is going to be more successful. And in a fair, I mean, everybody's taking chances. <laughs> so it's just one more chance they're taking, and it's more fun, and it's really fresh. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a question, only <laughs> putting, you, putting you on the spot, possibly, as we begin to break. This is more of a civic position. One, I want to thank you for your efforts. But more importantly, now that I know that I may, you haven't been here in 25 years, and Claudia, you just arrived three days ago, or two days ago, um, this is the putting you on the spot moment. Chicago is a big town, small town, that I always love to say collaborates and works well together. Carla's show is a perfect example of what a great institution and a great curator can do to band a great diverse audience. You've only been here for a couple of days. Any immediate perceptions from your uh, last couple of days as you have uh, just joined us and I may you just returned? Well, first the weather. I was not expecting this weather. <laughs> But I bought an amazing coat in Spain, so I'm, I'm ready for minus whatever. So that's great. No, jokes apart. Um, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the scene. I know people in Chicago say that the scene is like not super big, but I think it's fantastic. I saw amazing exhibitions. I saw amazing institutions, galleries with fascinating programs, artists. A lot of people also um, really wanting to talk about art and about cultural practitioners, cultural creations, which is something that I have to say, um, you don't find that easily. I mean, people so encourage, so really, uh, yeah, in maybe because we were introduced to the perfect people, but honestly, I think it has a lot of potential. Um, I, I even was thinking to, wow, this is a city that I could live in. I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed by, by the first impressions that I have. The shows are f fabulous, and the artists, fantastic. So, yeah. And, and, and I, have to, I have to tell my corny story, sorry. Yeah, yeah I have to. Uh, so, I mean, I'm back in Chicago after 25 years, and I mean, for me, I'm, I'm especially fond of Chicago because I came here when I was 14, and it was the first international trip I ever took outside of Buenos Aires. And, you know, I was like a young girl from Buenos Aires, and I was brought to Chicago and I saw the city, the scale, and I saw, you know, we, we have family friends here and they took me to a high school and I saw that high schools were like in the movies and that really produces a shock. I mean, I'm sorry, maybe if you grew up here you don't realize, but nobody expects things to be like in the movies, but they are. <laughs> and uh, so I love Chicago and I, for one reason or another, I've never been back uh, in, in all this time. Um, but also in Chicago, in the Art Institute, uh, is where um, I decided to be an art historian and to work in museums because I saw the Impressionist Room and I loved it and I had had a class about art in Buenos Aires. Anyway, seeing the art that I had studied like, like drove me crazy and I told my father, I want to work in museums. And then my father spent the next years trying to convince me to do something more profitable. He failed and here I am back in Chicago. So, this is a very emotional trip for me. I love the city, so, um, but it's a huge city, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, 
I might be like small town. I don't know. And sometimes New York also feels like a small town. Maybe it's because I also grew up in a big city like Buenos Aires. But I understand that none of these cities, nobody really owns the whole city. You just know all these little circles. And nothing is really, I mean, there's a limited amount of like knowledge that you can have. And you always create these little communities that connect with each other or not. But I mean, it feels very big to me. I don't know it that well, but I'm thrilled to be back and I found it as beautiful as back then. And you went this morning to visit the painting, right? I went this morning, yeah. <laughs> I, love I, think, it. I think that story is a perfect place to end. So I want to say my thank you to Carla and Aime and Claudia for being here, being in conversation, giving a little preview for what's to come for the 10th anniversary in April. Um, thank you all for coming as well. I uh, just want to note that if you want to stick around, have a drink, there's a bar in the back. We'd love to chat with you more. So thank you to everyone, and let's thank our panelists as well. <laughs>